Hold up! This isn't some cheesy kid show. This is Kids in the Tank, an interview with our keynote speakers and a young perspective on business and life from high school juniors and seniors. Welcome to Kids in the Tank. I'm Carlos, and with me in the tank are Maggie, Jesus, and Chloe. Today we are honored to have Justin Clough as our special guest. Justin Clough is currently working on music videos for predominantly country artists and is continuing to build his company. While also exploring different sectors of the film industry, Justin, you are officially in the hot seat. Ooh. Okay, so, hey, Justin, out of all of the famous people you have worked with, who are some of your favorites? Um, so, I, I go through, this is sort of a loaded question for me. It's like asking who your best friend is with your friends being able to listen into the answer. Um, um, but I, I, I've had very good experiences with everybody. Um, I'm closer with certain artists than others. Um, some artists come in, they do their job, and they head out. Um, other artists, like, like for instance, Morgan, Morgan Wallen, um, Florida Georgia Line, Chris Lane, Jake Owen, like, I would say I have a closer relationship with those guys. Um, and, and even, you know, Morgan is somebody who I would consider a pretty good friend. Um, you know, we'll hang out together. We were together for New Year's. Um, so I think that, that it, in terms of my favorite artists to work with, I guess, do we, if we lean towards creatively, you know, I've got a, a guy like Devin Dawson, who I think I creatively really, really vibe with. And I mean, he's just one of my really good homies in general. But um, yeah, I think that that question is very hard for me to answer because I am blessed and I am fortunate enough to work with um, mostly people who I, I thoroughly enjoy being around and, and have very a very good relationship with. So this is like a two-step question. Growing up, what did you want to be? And what was your favorite place or favorite memory of growing up? Man, growing up, uh, I, I said this a little bit earlier. I think that growing up, I, I really did want to, I wanted to be a director. I wanted to make movies. I wanted to be in charge of where the camera was, how the camera looked, um, what the actors were doing, why they were doing it. And I think I had a very good grasp on what feels natural um, and, and what looks natural. And that's something that I think leaned me into directing. Um, so growing up, I would, I would say I wanted to be what I am today, which is an amazing thing to be able to say. I know not a lot of people are able to say that. And, and where did I want to be was kind of an, uh, if that's like physically, like geographically, where did I want to be? I wasn't really sure. Um, kind of thought New York, kind of thought Los Angeles, and I ended up in Nashville, and I feel like I'm at home and I have no intention of going anywhere soon. So I, I, I really enjoy where I'm at. How did you get into cinematography and directing? Tell us how... Tell us about how your very first experience with feeling in control of the camera. Yeah, so my <laughs> so um, I had done a lot of day-to-day -day stuff where I was the only one there, and I was just kind of capturing whatever was happening in front of me, which isn't directing, right? That's more like capture. When you're directing, you're very much in control of every single thing that's happening on set, what they're doing, when they're doing it. You can take two. It's not like shooting a concert where you're simply shooting what's right in front of you. Um, the first big break I had, I think, was, I, I believe, 2015. Not big break, but it was the first time I realized, like, this is what I want to do. And I walked into it. I had never had more than four or $5,000 budgets to pull off concepts and, and ideas. And I had walked onto my first set that was like, it was like a $70,000 set, which was a huge jump. I kind of skipped this middle ground. I walked onto the set, and there was like, there's like cranes with lights, and there's like 60 people running around, like, setting things up and I like had this anamorphic lenses, which is something I dreamed about working with for like 10 years. And I had, uh, John Matishak was a DP who was an awesome, awesome director of photography. And, um, it was the first time where I left that set and it was so awesome working with everybody there. And I don't think anybody really knew that I didn't know exactly what I was doing, but I left that set and I felt like I was like, hi, I was just like, this is, that was so fun. Like I got to literally create exactly what was in my head. So I'd say 2015, um, first time I got on a really big set and had an assistant director and like all these moving pieces. And I had support to really focus on what I wanted to focus on in front of the camera. That was, um, that was probably the moment that I realized this is exactly what I want to do. But 
Yeah. Hey, hey, Justin. Um, this is Carlos. I just wanted to know yeah. um your motivation behind directing. So I personally also love uh you know filming and also editing, um and I I can I can see and understand having that perfect um, cinematic shot and how it you know there's like a good feel to it. Is the is the motivation similar to yours or is there like a different type of motivation that keeps you going? Um, my motivations have changed in all honesty throughout the process of learning to do what I do, and I would say that at the start. It was very much like wanting to get this perfect shot, right? When I was shooting on my own and I was like, man, I want to put the camera on a dolly and I want to figure out how I can do that without any money. And then I want to like, and then I would, you know, and I would figure out how to do that. And then I would take it into the editing room and the editing room is where I learned the most about directing with when I was inside of the editing room and I would sit there, I would, that's when you really glue a story together. You know, that's when you chop the trees down and carve the baseball bat. Like it's like, that's when you really like you have all these options, right? And and when I was able to condense them and put them together, and I was like, this shot next to this shot tells this story. And that's when I would learn, I wish I had shot this. I wish I had shot that. So next time I would go out and shoot a scene or direct a scene, I would make sure to cover the shots that I didn't have in the editing room on that prior shoot that I didn't get on that prior shoot. So for me, it, it started as like having all the shots to just connect the story, right? And then there's something very satisfying about like piecing together all these things and the continuity works. You know, you shoot, when we shot the, the, this Jake Owen video that I talked about um, when I was talking with the whole group, it was like, uh, we shot that on so many, we shot that over the course of three days and like the opening scene that we shot was literally the last thing we shot on day three. So when you have, when you, when you get into this world where you're able to, and then you get into the editing room and you built this entire world and you start piecing it together, it's the first time you can sit down and go, wow, that like really works. And then once you learn, once I learned how to do that fluently and I was comfortable with shooting out of order and executing a narrative, that's when I became really, really focused on the writing and the sentiment of each scene. And now that's what really pushes me is what am I trying to say to the, say about this? If I'm shooting dialogue, like what do I want these characters to be feeling within each line? And what do I want the subtext to be? And where do I want the emotion to sit? And, and what do I want the viewer to know prior to coming into this? And what do I want them to learn? You know, it's, it's building a scene is like, it's essentially an upside down triangle, right? So it's like, it starts big and it all needs to come down to one point and every line needs to reference that point and it needs to get you to that point and it needs to push the character to make that next decision. And if that's not done properly, a viewer will know. And it, it, a lot of times people will feel it. And because people are very, very good at knowing when something's wrong. It's like, well, that last conversation doesn't really lead to that decision you made. It just doesn't make sense, you know, and a viewer will know that. So now beyond continuity and getting things shot properly, I think that a lot of my motivation is like really telling a story that I have in my head that I feel is very, very important and narrowing that scene down to the the point that needs to be made so again my motivations have changed it started i wanted to shoot something beautiful then i wanted to shoot something that continuity wise like works and it tells the story even if it's a bad story and now that I have that unlocked i think my motivation is very much based around the sentiment and the point of each scene that i'm shooting and how i can write that scene better and and work with my camera to tell that story in a very creative way so just kind of growth in general Thank you. Yeah. So, Justin, what is it like for you always being behind the camera and hardly ever in front of it? I love it. I'm, like, not really, uh, uh, like, I feel like the stories that are inside of me are not something. I, I, I do make cameos. Like, actually, in that Jake video, I am, I'm Jay, I play Jake's best friend. Um, and I, I am able to act, but I, I really, really enjoy it watching the image come to life so when we're on set right we have there's probably 10 monitors on set and we have a 17 inch monitor where i'm able to sit and just watch the scene i have headphones on everybody's mic'd up so i can hear everything that's happening and um i i really really enjoy watching and sitting there and looking at that frame and watching the camera move and when the camera movement works with the dialogue that's being delivered you can feel that scene come to life on set and i really really love that satisfaction of 
you know, two months of work and watching that camera move tell just as much of a story as the, the small amount of dialogue that has been narrowed down in the actors delivering. And when I feel that emotion come, you know, come together, I think like, to me, that's much more satisfying than anything in front of camera. Because in front of camera, you spend most of your time doing what you're told. You can play with it. You can creatively kind of, you know, move around and do certain things. But as a director, you're in control of how that actor delivers his line, where he's sitting, how he moves, what he's doing, how the camera moves up over the top of him or behind him. Or is he realizing or noticing something? Is the camera pushing in? Is is the world getting bigger? Is the camera pulling out? Does he feel alone? Is, is everybody around him looking away? I think there's a lot of small things, and I really, really love being able to focus on the details um, that specifically lie within the monitor. Um, and, and all of that happens behind cameras. So, so I think that naturally I just enjoy my time behind camera uh, much more than my time in front of camera. So it's it, Jesus. <clears throat> so I have another, like, two questions. So throughout your journey in cinematography, who has been the most influential person you have met in the industry? And my second question is, what do you see yourself from like five years or 10 years from now? Man, influential. Um, I met a guy who did a lot of editing work for Stanley Kubrick. And um, Stanley Kubrick, as a filmmaker, is legendary for a handful of reasons. Um but it was very, very interesting talking to anybody, in all honesty, who had, who has had a hand in, in something that Stanley Kubrick has been a part of. And listening to him talk about not being afraid to break certain rules and experiment with certain things. And um, it, was, it was a very brief conversation, actually, but it was very, very inspiring. Um, other than that, I would say it's not necessarily people who have been in a higher up place than me. It's... it's my my friend Ben Skipworth, who produces all of my projects for me, has produced everything I've done for the last year. Um, he has inspired me to figure out what I want to do next. Beyond, you know, because I have this very, very satisfied life shooting music videos right now. I could do it for forever. But he's been very, he's like, hey, man, you need to shoot narrative. You need to shoot narrative. You need to be working on a movie. You need to be doing this. And um, having someone like that in my life has been very, very inspiring to just know that I have support from other people who are deeply ingrained within the film industry to go further and do more than what I'm doing. And that really, really keeps me inspired and it keeps me hungry. It makes you feel like there's other people waiting on this creative that you have inside of your head. And, and I also do vice versa. He's also a writer. So um, I think the two of us keep each other very, very inspired uh, from project to project and, and making sure that we keep our eyes on the prize and what the, what the goal is at the end of, you know, what our five-year goal is, which which is hopefully, you know, film festivals, making movies. Um, I mentioned earlier, we have a film that I had written. It's a 96 page script. Um, and we are planning on filming in Duluth, hopefully next winter, uh, pending funding and pending all of that. But I think that he is the one who, who has really pushed me to get to that point and write that script and finish that script because writing 120 pages or 100 to 120 pages obviously takes a lot of thought and a lot of um, dedication to the craft and it's very hard to sit down and really do that because it doesn't exist until you decide to put it down on paper so I think in, in the next five years hopefully that film and in other films that I've written I have an animated World War II film that I'm also uh, writing and working on right now um, will be a part of the bigger picture they'll be a part of whether Netflix wants you know wants a piece of the pie or whether uh, Showtime or you know, whether it's a theater release, it could be a theatrical release or it's a film festival movie. Um, I, I would really love to move forward within the film industry and within the actual movie industry or TV industry um, in terms of creating bigger projects and bigger pieces and more consumed, um, more consumed pieces. So over the course of your career, what has been the biggest challenge or obstacle that you've overcome? Yeah, um, I think that for me, it, a lot of it was overcoming the explanation of what I want to be doing. When you're in a spot, and that's, that's a constant thing, you know, because you always want to move forward, right? So when you're in a spot, and, and you're in a spot that a lot of people would kill to be in, it's very hard to explain to people why you would want to move beyond that or move forward. So I think it's very hard for people who are like, well, just do this one last project for me. It's like, that's that's no longer the place that I'm in. 
I'm now in this place where I'm writing movies and I'm working on my writing and I'm working on film. So for me, uh, it's this explanation to people like, look, this is what you see right now is not what's in my head. What's, what's being released right now is, is very far behind what I'm working on and what I want to be doing. So it's, it's getting people to understand that I'm always, I'm so, I'm, I'm always moving forward. And I'm always trying to think big picture and I'm always trying to figure out what I can be doing that's better than what I did prior. So it's really, really hard to, to get people to understand like, look, I'm, I'm very willing to work with, with you on this, but you have to understand that I, I have a lot of time that's being dedicated into a new piece of my life and a new piece of my career. So, and, and I think that, again, just getting that point across to people is um, harder than you would think. But a lot of that is also because film is such a huge industry that it's very hard to explain to people what it is I specifically do in general. So I, I would consider that a huge barrier that I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to overcome and a lot of time trying not, you know, I have to take everything with a grain of salt. Like if I don't talk about it, I can't expect people to know about it. So, but it's very hard sometimes to hold your tongue and be like, Hey man, I, you know, I'm trying to move forward. I'm trying to move past that type of work. So, and it's just always, it's always there. I think no matter what I do, I will always be thinking about what's next. And that's, again, that's that double-edged sword that I think I talked about earlier. And it's like creative suffer, a lot of creative suffer with it where you're never satisfied with what's right in front of you. And, and it's unfortunately just very, very hard to deal with sometimes because nobody will understand what you, it is you really want to do. Yeah. All right. For our last question, we would just like to know what your biggest piece of advice would be for our generation. Your generation is, uh, ironically, you were not that far removed. I'm only 26. Um, and again, I'm, I'm blessed and very young to be doing what I'm doing and, and have the company that I have. But um, man, I, like, you've got to be crazy enough to think you can do it. And you have to, and if you are crazy enough to think you can do it, make sure you prove it to people because I think it's very easy to just let yourself to say you're going to do it, say you're going to do it, say you're going to do it. You're never going to do it. You really got to find that passion, right? And I think it's important to make sure you believe in yourself and believe in your own ideas because if you don't believe in your own, own ideas, nobody else is going to believe in them with you. So it's, it's, I've never met anybody who's created something that didn't believe in it from the start and got other people to believe in it. That's just not the narrative. That's not how it works. Like, you know, George Lucas, when he created Star Wars, he was just a total psychopath. He was doing it on a budget that didn't make sense. He was telling a sci-fi story when before sci-fi was relevant, you know, like, so it's just that I think you really, really have to have to stick firm to your ideas and you have to believe in yourself because if you don't believe in yourself again, nobody else is going to believe in you either. So just make sure that you continue to work. And, and that's not to say like, don't have a job or don't because you believe like the entire time that I, wasn't making money off of film i was working another job on the side because it's important to stay focused it's important to make money it's important to understand that you can't just float along you know you need to stay hungry and, and i think a job kept me very hungry to get out of that job but um yeah just believe in yourself believe in your ideas no matter how crazy they sound no matter how many people think you're crazy for saying them and no matter how many times someone looks at you like you're an idiot if i would have told somebody when i was 16 i was going to win an oscar they would have laughed in my face and now when i say it it doesn't seem as crazy so slowly but surely i think people will come around and they'll they'll open their arms to you and hopefully by the time they do that you're moved way beyond it they didn't believe in you from the start so okay thank you for answering our questions we will now be moving into our next segment flip it where you will be asking us the questions wow okay I like this segment. I wasn't prepared for this. It's catching me off guard a little bit here. Um, so, Carlos, you said you're you're into filmmaking yourself, right? Yeah. What what is it um, that you aspire to be, and and what is it that inspires you in general? Are there day to day things that inspire you? Is it things you see on Instagram? Is it things you watch on TV? Like, what is it that that makes you want to create friends? 
Well, uh, firstly, I I do basically commercials for my dad's company, which is a trucking company. Okay. I uh, I basically yeah. just strap GoPros onto the the semis and get you know shots that usually don't get, and yeah. uh, makes it look uh, like like. You know, we're actually moving, we're actually doing something. And then, um, of course, I've edited videos such as for um, school projects. Um, I will, But also I've taken um, footage outside, like in the world, because, you know, it's, it's better to get it organic than just getting stock footage off of YouTube. But um, basically that's, that's what keeps me going. And, I mean, it's an industry that doesn't get really any exposure to, like, the media and I kind of want to just expose it to the media and, and show people that, you know, this is going on and this in, this industry does exist and that, um, you know, it's something cool about it. That's how you get those amazing shots. That's awesome. So it's, it's, the, it's the general inspiration of, of wanting to tell the story of a story that you feel hasn't been told. Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, hmm. What do you guys feel... So, so you guys are in high school. What do you feel is the biggest obstacle? And this can go to anybody, really. What, what's the biggest obstacle that you guys feel you face uh, when it comes to the decisions you're making in the future? For your future. I can probably answer them. I feel like the biggest obstacles yeah. that we face, like to, like, to our success, is like pe- people putting us down and stuff. And like, I feel like it just... Put you, like when people put you down, you feel like you can't do it, and then it gets in your head, and then you want to give up and stuff like that. But you gotta like push yourself to like prove them wrong. Like you said, like how you did it for some point, and then your ego got up. But then those same people that was your close friends were the one that brought you back down. But yeah, I feel like that's our biggest obstacle. Like just trying to like get the negative input that we, people are putting into us, and just look at it in the positive side. Mm-hmm. And I think it's important to make sure that you guys are the generate like. Your generation as a whole, again, you're not the, I'm not that far removed from y'all. So just make sure you don't let people put your generation into a box. And it really, really bothers me. Um, it's nothing against the prior speaker, but he literally said, companies don't want to hire millennials because they think they're lazy. And I just, I just totally disagree with that. I hire tons and tons and tons of young people on my sets. And my sets are, a lot of times, I'm the oldest person on my set. And I'm running some of the biggest sets uh in the South. So it's like, you know, I think that make sure that you guys as a generation are prove people wrong. Like if people really want to think that prove them wrong. And and I just, I hate that the older generation put your generation into a box because some of the things that I've seen creatively and some of the work that I've seen that goes into making something that they've made, that, that, that your generation has made creatively is just like beyond the way that my brain thinks. So I think just make sure you don't let that, comments like that from an older generation get you all down. I think that's very important. And I'm actually very, very passionate about that. Any more questions you got for us? Man, I think that that's good on me. How, how is, is there, is there a film industry there? Or do you guys ever, are you guys, have you guys ever been exposed to it? Or do you guys get to spend any time around it? Or like, is it something that anybody really thinks about? Um, there, where, where I, where some of us come from, there is a, like a, a, a yearly film festival that we have, uh, usually for short mm-hmm. films. Um, mm-hmm. but pretty much that's it. Um, we do, we do live next to a liberal arts college, so they usually come up with, uh, some cool short films that we end up, uh, seeing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, like, yeah, I know... I, I w- oh. Go ahead, go ahead, my bad. No, I was just going to say, if you you know, if you know, guys are able to get your hands on, whether it, even if it's working at the Film Commission, I know Minneapolis um, and Minnesota in general has a great film commission, um, and I know that they film a fair amount of movies up there, but, man, I would just see if there's anything you guys can get your hands on, because, again, I think that a lot of figuring out what you want to do is having had it put in front of you. You know, how are you going to figure it out if it's not put in front of you, even if you want to work in the medical industry until you get into a hospital you don't understand how many jobs are within the hospital you know like until you get on a film set you don't see how many jobs there are on a film set and uh, i just i wish that i had had that when i was younger i wish i had gone out and really pursued that or found even like a studio like 
Hey man, you guys, you know, you run a video studio. Let me intern. Let me do anything. I'll set up lights. I just want to be around equipment, be around gear, be around shoots. But it'd be cool to, to make to see if anybody within this group is able to go find that or make that happen. I think it, it's a very, it would be a very good case starter um, if anybody is interested in film. So, like, I know, like, in part of Chicago, I know, like, two companies personally, 24 production, 24K Productions and Vision 55. Mm -hmm. They, like, focus on making mm -hmm. music videos for, like, Hispanic artists. So, like, for anybody mm -hmm. interested in going there and get some hand internships or something, they can go down there. It's, like, an hour away or two. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Just go see. Just go see what's going on, you know? And go, go like, learn and just be a part of that industry. Just insert yourself into it. As, as politely and as respectfully as possible. Um, and if people are, and people are so cool in the entertainment industry, man, like I have people who reach out to me all the time that I bring on set that had they not reached out to me, they just would have never been there. But yeah, I think that, um, I don't know, do, do what you can, you know, even find the, the, the psych walls and places that rent out lights, find a camera rental house. You know, you get into a camera rental house, that's renting out Ari Alexa cameras or these cameras that they shoot Blade Runner on or whatever, because they're everywhere. They're in every city. You get into a rental house and you're just helping rent out equipment. You start learning about the equipment and you end up on set. And then from set, you start, you know, you start being a director of photography or, you, you know, like just small things like that are, are very, very important. I think to be hands on with. And I wish I would have been hands on with them much earlier in my life. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Anything else, Any, anything else Justin? I feel good. I will let you guys uh, get out of here. Okay, thank you so much for joining us today tonight. We appreciate your insight. Goodbye. Yeah. Bye. 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 Thank Goodbye. You. Thank you. Thank you. to Kids in the Tank. We are now entering our third and final segment, the round table. We will now be talking about how today's hot topics and trends. <laughs> I cannot talk. Ooh. So, so um, we were talking about what like trends we should talk about last week. Yeah. Literally so much happened last week that we got so many new topics. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't really like what, like what, like, like what. There's, there's a lot. Of I, I don't know. Bring I don't, one up. Like what, what happened? <laughs> I don't know. What happened? It, like, I mean, you think that? Come on. You're the no? one who said there's a lot of topics. Oh, but, last week. okay. All right. Um, well, um, I, everybody heard about you know Kobe Bryant. Yeah. And you know his daughter and the seven other people that um passed away in the yeah. helicopter crash. Was seven. Oh yeah, you did say seven. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tweaking. Okay. Um. Yeah. No, that was that was really sad. I mean. I remember the the day it happened, and it was like well, the day was only like four days ago. <laughs> um, uh, it was just all over my feed on Instagram yeah. and and Facebook, and it was like yeah, it kind of still is all over too. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On and Twitter like, a lot. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Instagram sure. stories. <coughs> yeah, and like there's so many tributes, like like how the Raptors game they they timed out the clock for like 24 seconds because he was the number 24, mm -hmm. or like how they want to change the the N NBA symbol. To him, um, there's a bunch sure. of things. Yeah, yeah. Dang, I did not know them. Yeah, I'm not educated on basketball. My bad. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and like how um, this um, how, what was it? The, like it was, I think, in New York when they like turned the the colors purple and yellow. Yeah. Right. I think so. And and um, I don't know what did they do anything at the Grammys? 
because yeah, Lizzo's there. like I think Lizzo like dedicated oh her gosh. performance. Or was it like Alicia? Oh, first. Alicia Keys, right? Alicia she Keys, she was the one that mentioned maybe. it in the first place. Right? I didn't really watch it. So. Yeah, yeah me neither. I just yeah. are you not into basketball like in general? When, like, not really. Nope. No. no. <laughs> well, I used to be like back in eighth grade when I thought it was good, and I was gonna make it to the NBA. <laughs> and my first team was actually the Golden State, their mm-hmm. rival. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. But you know, my dream ended freshman year when I did not qualify. <laughs> for the Bill <laughs> Memorial yeah. basketball team. Did you make uh, it on, like, JV2 or something? <laughs> not even that. I, mean, I, mean, <laughs> like, got, cut? I got cut? because, like, my... Per- like, so I was good at ball handling and shooting, but just, like, endurance in general was, like, horrible. Yeah. And the bad thing for us, we, we lack the height. Yeah, we, we like the height. height. I don't got no hops. Like, I don't know how people be jumping, like, six feet up. <laughs> exactly. I really can get two feet out of the air. <laughs> like, come on. I'm not even that big, too. Like, I'm in, like, 150. Okay. Five, five. That's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> and talking about that, I mean, we also have, like, Greece electing the first woman president. Um, there's been a lot. It's been good for, for a lot of uh um, I feel like that's going to empower Harold Clinton to run for president again. She'll be like, oh, yes, really? I can make it. <laughs> She'll be like, I can make it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So did the mm. NFL. They um they um they also hired the first woman coach, which, uh, which is actually pretty cool because they're actually going to the Super Bowl. Yeah. You know, they, you know, y'all play football? Y'all play, play football. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Of course. I like yeah. football. No, I don't play. I I play it sometimes. Oh, My cousins play it. Nice. nice. See, this is like, I don't know why you're like pretending. No, girls play football. <laughs> girls play football, bro. I'm pretty good, too. For real? Yeah. Damn. Yeah. What position? I don't know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so you play football, but you don't know. Uh, when I did Powder Puff, uh, my, wait, so- wait, what is my that? sophomore, it's girls, girls it's football. Girl. Oh, yeah. We do homecoming. it at Homecoming. You know, you should um, I was a center. I kind of sucked, but... A center? Yeah, center. So, like, this kid today, during, like, during the presentation of the keynote speaker, so he was like, I play football. I forgot his name. He's from Clinton. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what do you play center? And, I was, and he told me, he's like, he literally makes his, like, the rival game, like, the team. He makes it his bitch. That's how he looked at it. He like... <laughs> I think that's my school, he, Turner. No, it was Clinton. That's our, yeah, no, but, like... Clinton and Turner are like rivals. Oh, so he's like, he's like, when I'm going against like somebody, I just make sure I make them my bitch and I tell them that they're in the game. And I found that he learned like funny as shit because like, I never thought of it like to motivate yourself to like, because sending people, I guess, like they push it and like protect the offense player mm-hmm. and shit like that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I found that like pretty interesting. And then he tried to scare me by going like that. <coughs> so, nah, boy, not working oh. with me. Mm-hmm. Last time I played football, I just ended up getting a concussion. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was over two games, but then... No, man. I played football, like, in eighth grade. Now I always got the 250-pound oh. oh. kids 250? coming at me because I was a small kid. I was a running back. And uh, I was so scared. I dropped the ball. I was like, nah, just fuck this shit. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, okay. Never imagine. Okay. Oh, okay. So, talking about big news. Literally, it like, it's the same thing as Ebola. We're, like, talking about, like, like the coronavirus. And yeah, I don't want to get that shit. Nobody... Who got Mm-mm. it? I don't want to get that. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's basically new information every day, um, like how we have five cases here in the United States. And I heard like, some, like, I heard this morning, like, at school, like, now there might be some in, like, Burlington. And, for, like, shut up, for real? Yeah. In Madison, too. Uh, Madison, I'm not too. Going to school. I'm going home school. Mom, you heard that? <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, um, then, you know, some people claim that they get it without even going to China, but that doesn't make sense. I mean... Well, like, if you get it, like, if you know somebody that went to China, then, like, if you see them, like, because uh, I guess it's kind of like, you can, like, have it for... Why am I raising my hand for him? You can have it for, like, two weeks and not even know that you have it and yeah, still be passing it on to people, mm-hmm. so... Damn, but what about if it's contaminated from other goods that they transport to the United States? Like, I mean, think about true. it. Like, what about if our iPhones have it? Shit. Well, it, I, I mean, mean it, it works yeah. a lot. Or like, like the, the clothes we're wearing right now, like oh. Well, shit. I think your clothes are like older than like the coronavirus. Yeah. Virus. What about if I ordered something like new? Some, like you got some that? Like if you ordered that last night and got it this morning, maybe I don't know. I don't know. Diane Hendricks gave it to me. Thank <laughs> <you>. Shout <laughs> out to her. Um. No, yeah, but what's it called? It's it works a lot like the flu. You know, you could prevent it by like just normally like vaccine, washing your hands. Oh. Uh, to, you know getting sanitizer, <laughs> you know, normal stuff to prevent, you know, I thought cold. it just, like, you just got it through the air. Right? <laughs> yeah, me too. I thought, I didn't know you Well, could. I mean, you gotta be around the people. Oh, oh okay. That's what makes sense. You, you don't have it, right? Because oh. you're not speaking at all about it. I don't it. know like, what to I'm say. I'm kind of scared. I'm kind of scared because she's probably like, oh, shit, I got it. <laughs> no, that's, that's crazy. Um, I don't think I'd be here right now, but, okay. No, well, what about if you're in that two weeks? Like, if you're not <laughs> yeah. detected? Um, 
know. I mean, but, and you know about it, like you feel like, like, damn, I feel like I got it, but you don't want to no. say anything. You you guys know the symptoms, like how no. they. Like, it's like regular. they're like the same symptoms as like a regular. Yeah. Cold. Right. So? Right. And then oh. they just they just get like there's just there's a point where like they just get so tired that they just you know just fall over. And it's like there's a, there's a bunch of videos that <clears throat> that show like there was this guard guarding like a gate and then he just falls over. Damn. And um. like the, it just I don't know it just gets you so tired and just. Well, what what was the place that he was guarding? Huh? What was the place he was guarding? I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I um, thought it was somebody. Oh, yeah. And then uh, there's just like these dumb you know conspiracies how you got it and stuff and like I heard like you get get it from like bat soup and all that. Mm. I mean I don't eat I'm not gonna soup. say all those weird mukbangs they make over there but. Um, they eat yeah. some weird things. What about yeah. those insects they eat? Oh. Mm. <laughs> you, you, you guys see those videos? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my! There's this girl that like on TikTok. I watched this girl on TikTok and she like eats it. Oh, was a sail? Then, then it just, it just like squirts yeah. out. Oh, my, that's disgusting! I swear, <laughs> she makes so many videos and like, oh man, it's so weird. It, and then she's just not slapping it and like I don't know why she slaps it. Good, it, good thing it, I know, cause what? like I was gonna do like I have an Asian friend who's from China. Oh, and you're gonna was, bring this up. And uh, <laughs> I was gonna do like um, a YouTube video about tasting their food, different cultures. Oh, and yeah. I was gonna taste my food, like it was gonna be like spicy and shit, and his mm-hmm. food was gonna be like nasty and shit. Oh, okay. I didn't do it, because mm-hmm. what about if I got this right recent shit? I mean, I don't, know. Died. I don't know. And it's... I would have not been in this podcast. <coughs> okay. Well, I mean, it takes two weeks, you would have been in here anyways, and you would have got six. Um, but, anyways, uh, I mean. Uh, like... Well, I got a topic y'all probably don't know about. So. Y'all familiar with Rockton? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know that school, Hanigo? Huh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So there was this, um, I, guess, I don't think she's, I think she's um, pay, payroll clerk. She was controlling, like, everybody's PTO in the whole school. And she managed to steal, like, $39,000. What the? And, like, she's going to jail, like, right now. And I'm, I'm, like, happy and not happy at the same time. So, like, how do you know about this? Because, if oh, because I'm a big finance guy, so I, like, research oh, about okay, frauds okay, and all okay. that. So like not, My cousin went to that high school. He graduated real? like three years and ago. It's, and like, people were suspecting it because like they went to Disneyland like twice a year. And she's a like payroll clerk. They don't get paid much. They get paid like fifteen dollars an hour. How do you manage to go vacations? But it also happened. A teacher told me it also happened like my freshman year was like twenty seventeen. It happened like at Craig. Mm-hmm. The librarian was still money and she managed to like a hundred k, which I find it pretty interesting. Like how, that's you gotta have like like intelligence to like steal that much money. And then they, they just get end up getting caught, as you can see. Well, true, but what, like the lady in Dixon, in Illinois, she <laughs> did it like for four years straight, and look what she did, like. Got. And then she lost all her money, and then she went to jail for twenty years in the same. Yeah, that sounds bad. Huh? To be honest, um, no, yeah, um, you guys hear about the summer fest? All that, all that summer stuff is coming up. I swear, mm-hmm. I just want summer to come up really quick. Um, yeah, I heard, I actually seen the Miami, like, lineup. It's literally every rap artist you can think of. From, yeah. like, Travis Scott to... And be a young boy. Yeah. I don't Damn. Know. Yeah. I, don't, I don't listen to rappers like that. <clears throat> no, yeah, everybody... What do you listen to? I mean, Hispanic music. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Isaiah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, you... you uh, I'm going to see Young Gravy in March. Who's that? Oh, uh, he's like, he's like a rapper, kind of. Listen to Bad Bunny. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. He go crazy. <laughs> You hear these names? Young Gravy, Bad Bunny. Yeah. That's crazy. I was going to make a joke, but that's not going to... It's like Young Gravy with Turkey. What? Not get out the pocket. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. That's funny. That's funny. Wait, and I'm... Um, <coughs> Eminem still exists? I thought... I thought he... <laughs> I just it says um new album what I thought he like died oh, yeah, he got like, a new not album. died no, but like, he did like not, die. not died but like um died his music like, he was yeah. like he was like he was like hibernating or for something real? <coughs> why yeah. I don't know see gang affiliated too like six mm, nine no oh, I don't what? know they're looking for him is it six is six nine dead yeah he's dead right no no, no? He's, in jail. he's in jail he's in jail again oh, okay. again <laughs> again he's like, well again he's almost out but you know yeah that's his home for permanently not all that money he got got him a nice home. Yeah, just wait till he comes out. Then we'll see what happens. True. Um, no, yeah, he made an album. Um, uh, the last one I heard was Kamikaze. He called it Kamikaze. Um, I don't want to know. Yeah, I don't, I don't really listen to him either. But um, he made, you guys know Juice World, right? Yeah. yeah. So I think he made one on his new album, which is like you never expect because, you know, Eminem. Anim- Eminem. Eminem. Eminem is, is like, crazy, like crazy aggressive, like when he raps and then you had Juice World. Yeah. Like, 
the so, opposite. Who's like Drake? Who sings? Well, no, more like, de- like depressed. Like, oh, that's yeah. Sure. yeah. So, oh. so like I Eminem sings about depressing stuff sometimes. Yeah, you know? for real. You yeah. could, I, I don't know. It's it, just but the he, way, like you the can't way. like tell because it's not like slow. It's like fast. Mm-hmm. So you have to like listen. I'm like yeah, the, I'm like a tacuache. I listen to full <sighs> corrido. Don't listen. Don't listen. Okay. Okay. Um. Yeah. No. No. I love that music too. Anyways, that's fine. Um. Uh. What was I gonna say? Uh. So do you guys think Facebook is dying? No. I don't know. Of course it depends. Not. It depends so. who you ask. Like I feel like I don't know. Like I know my mom and my friends' moms. They're always like sharing stuff on Facebook. Yeah, me too. Like, mm-hmm. Commenting on stuff, tagging like me and stuff. I'm like. Uh, but yeah. what about for our generation? I don't know. I still use it. <coughs> I use it to save my pictures. I don't really like post mm-hmm. anything. Mm-hmm. I just post all my pictures and then <laughs> you know, put those, them in albums. Those companies we try to finesse you like twelve dollars a month to save more storage. On your I phone. pay ninety nine cents a month for iCloud storage and it doesn't even work. So see, just yeah. put them on Facebook. Use for... Google Photos. Oh, I do. I, I don't. They I, charge I, you too. I, though, I like, no, like, they don't. For real? They don't I like me. stopped. I just stopped doing that. Capping. Oh. What? No, but it's it's funny because. Facebook used to be like just everything like you post your pictures and you know you're you know, they used to be that you post everything you do mm-hmm. but now it's like yeah like there's every individual app that does that so like mm-hmm. you got Instagram that which is like uh, uh, you post like something cool about like a, a picture right that's like you know I look nice in it and all that and then you got like Twitter where you just know all the news all that you know even memes all that and like you know you got the professionals like LinkedIn and um there's uh, many other. Don't want to know why I got Twitter, like being that ass. Why? To follow Trump, cause he was being funny as hell during the elections. Mm. Like you could have followed him on Facebook, but he doesn't post as much. Twitter's he tweets, better. He tweets more. There goes, yeah. I didn't know he had a Facebook. Yeah, I didn't know either until I followed him. <laughs> <laughs> you follow him? Why? <laughs> well, I mean, I gotta know. He's our president, so. True. True. <coughs> That's all I gotta know. Hopefully, he don't get impeached. You know how? I think it's. Oh, Congress he's already is. impeached. Oh, he is. Yeah, but you just. He's not out of office. Oh. He's impeached, but not. Yeah, out of I don't. I don't follow that political shit. Like it gives me headaches. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, yeah. You guys remember Aaron Hernandez? You know who he is? The the oh, football player who yeah. got arrested. Mm-hmm. Did he kill someone? No. Wait, isn't he the one that punched like punched somebody in the face or like slapped somebody? I don't know. He's Can't the one that all the girls think is hot, but oh. now he's dead. Uh, he's dead. Oh, yeah. there. Yeah, there uh. was a documentary on Netflix. I started watching it, and then I it just started getting nah, boring. I didn't is watch it good? It. No. Oh, he said it was getting boring. Oh, right? yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, yeah, it was like <laughs> the memes were really funny. It's like I wouldn't mind dying to him. It's like something <laughs> like that. <laughs> that. That was crazy. Wait, do y'all know how he died? Like, how did he die? I think he killed himself. What suicide? I think so. That's like I feel like that's the saddest shit ever. You got all that money and you still get depressed. Well, Come he was get he was gonna go to jail, and you know because oh. he killed someone. So I mean, I would have paid to him man, to be honest. All that money. You would have paid a what? A hitman, like somebody that kills oh. for you. Okay. Wait, okay. Somebody, okay. you would pay somebody to kill you, like kill to kill yourself. What? Like no, cause so right. why did he kill? He was going to jail, right? So he mm-hmm. committed a crime. Right. And you said he, the crime he killed somebody. Right. So I would have hired somebody to kill the person I was. But what targeting. if they found out? Then you'd still go to jail. Yeah. And then you would have wasted your money too. <clears throat> True, but that's why you clean your steps. Yeah, no, it's okay. fine. Cover ups. No, yeah, there's a lot of ways you gotta be like good criminal and think I'm I'm in criminal law that teaches me a lot. So you have to be a criminal, like just like you gotta good, be a good criminal to get away with it, right? Yeah. Nice. Y'all, y'all don't believe in good criminal and bad criminal? I believe in mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. doing anything illegal. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean I've never really done anything like bad. Okay, so. do you wear your seatbelt every time you drive? <laughs> yeah, I do. Do you? No. See? I mean, That's like illegal. I think it was like once actually. I okay. Yesterday, I think it was yesterday or the day before. It was yeah. It was Monday. I was driving through the school parking lot. Didn't have my seatbelt on. So it was for like illegal. two for like two seconds, and then I put it back on. Yeah, because I felt weird. There's no time. It says no seatbelt while you're driving. There's no illegal. police officer, so. But no, I know you didn't get catching the act, but yeah. you still committed a crime. Technically, don't you have to be on public streets in yeah. order for it to be illegal? Yeah. I don't know. And yeah, like, I in think the school parking lot. There was nobody there. It was like six o'clock. Yeah, so. and I think you have to be on public streets for it to be illegal. Okay, well, some, um, who texts while they're driving or pl- changes music? See, we're all criminals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say uh, no. Okay, it like, depends. Like, it's like, 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 like cover ups, right? It so depends. Like, oh, when just a cut, oh shit, I gotta put this shit away or such shit like that. Wait, right? is it actually illegal in Wisconsin? To text and yeah, drive? It's illegal. Actually, it, I think it's a federal. Everywhere. Like, it is in Illinois, I know. Well, for no, sure. in Illinois, Call it's illegal to like, do anything on your yeah. phone. You can't even talk on the phone. Yeah. Like, like this. You have to have a Bluetooth or something. Yeah, but like in Wisconsin, you can talk on the phone, like, 
but you can't text because mm-hmm. you, you can't text yeah. anywhere. So we live in Beloit, right? And I commit crimes like on the daily basis. Okay, you are, why did you admit that, man? <laughs> why you're not? Pr- I'm proud of living in Beloit. But you think we're the only ones listening? Beloit, Wisconsin. <laughs> you find me in my location. <laughs> Okay. Oh man. Um. No. Oh, yeah. I so, mean, like, I, if you get in trouble at school tomorrow, I mean, why would I get in trouble? Because you just like said you committed crime. So. Okay, but they had to catch me in the crime, like y'all saying. Right. They need proof. It, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you proof. did just okay, confess, okay, so. Okay. I guess. But where's the evidence? But the they confession. Can't use, they can't, the they evidence can't use is the what confession. What I said. That thing is tempted though. Shit. <laughs> what, do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? Okay. Um. What was I gonna say? Um. One more thing. Oh no! That I cut the tags off the the mattresses. That's illegal. Why? Wait, why? Wait, Wait what? what? Because they, they they like you can't do that. What why, do you mean? Why? What do you mean? Why? So I, why does they, it they're only on mattresses yeah. because what? Why does that matter? Like if you cut it off or not? Like because because they used to fill. Oh, they, okay. There's a whole long story. Wait, I saw wait, this wait, video wait, on explain, Facebook. Explain it real quick. Explain it because well, okay, <laughs> well okay. They, back then they used to put stuff that just like a bunch of junk, and then like that that junk would cause like bacteria to build up in the mattresses, and then people would get sick. Now that mattresses is like a seal, proving that there's like just feathers and cotton or something that's in the mat- mattress. The wires. And right. Like yeah. Um. So cutting that would be like technically illegal and all that. Oh, damn. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, it's not like, oh, let me set your house. Straight. Let's see if you cut your tag. Like this I, don't know. I, guess, I guess that's that's the way it works. There's some dumb boss. Uh, all right. Well, ready, guys? A one, a two, a three. Kids, Kids in, in the, the tank, tank out. out. This tank isn't possible without your help. For more information on this tank and how you can help, interact with us on our social media or visit our website at gsbiztank.org.